Dear delegates, a very good morning. If I can ask you to find your seats, uh, we would like to begin with the fifth plenary session on the politics of energy security. I think we had a very constructive day yesterday, uh, and I hope you had uh, good meetings uh, uh, throughout the day. Um, uh, today, this morning, we want to talk uh, about how war, conflict, and competition have affected global energy supri uh, supplies, the concerns they have prompted about uh, reliable supply, uh, impact on consumers and the economy. So we are talking about something that is at the intersection of geoeconomics and geopolitics, an area where the ISS does a lot of work. And of course, countries are increasingly interested in securing and diversifying their energy sources. And in this plenary, we will discuss how producing and importing countries seek to cooperate to satisfy their energy needs. We will proceed in the established way where we will have uh, uh, four statements from our speakers from the podium. Uh, they will then uh, come take their seats again and we will have, after they have spoken, a question and uh, answer session and interventions from the floor. Just to remind everybody of the two-step process to seek the floor, insert your delegate batch on the right side of your microphone unit that activates the unit. You then, if you want to enter the speaker or the, the queue uh, requesting the floor, you have to press the microphone button. Then the green light will come on on your microphone. That means you're in the queue. I will then activate uh, your microphone from here when I call on you. And I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Uh, the uh, first speaker uh, I'd like to ask uh, to take the floor in a, in a minute is uh, Yasim Albu Daivi, the Secretary General of the Gulf Cooperation Council, Your Excellency. Welcome. Uh, just to mention it uh, so that there's no confusion, uh, uh, the Secretary General needs to uh, depart uh, at 10.15 promptly uh, for a pressing matter that has come up that he needs to uh, uh, address. Uh, second uh, will be uh, Osama uh, Mubaris, the Secretary General of the East Mediterranean uh, uh, Gas Forum. Uh, third is going to be uh, Amos Hochstein, the Senior Advisor uh, to the U.S. President, President uh, for Energy and Investment. And last but not least, we have Thanos Dokos, the National Security Advisor of Greece. So with that, we'll get underway. Your Excellency, if I may ask you to take the floor, and we're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, may I start by expressing my sincere gratitude to the esteemed leadership of the Kingdom of Bahrain for graciously hosting this event and granting me the honor and privilege in addressing uh, you. I would also like to extend my appreciation to the Inst International Institute for Strategic Studies and the organizations are the organizers of the Manama Dialogue for providing this important platform that brings together government ministers, policy makers, experts, and influencers in a unique forum for discussing critical issues in foreign policy, defense, and security in the Middle East. Turning to the crucial topic of the new politics of energy security, I would like to reaffirm, reaffirm that it holds a paramount position in the policies of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, which serves as a pivotal access in the global realm of oil and gas, ensuring energy security worldwide. Distinguished guests, it is crucial to examine the status of energy security in today's world, which can be attributed to a number of factors such as 1. Conventional conflict 2. Lack of backup plans 3. 
misguided narratives that alternative energy sources can replace fossil fuel for years of underinvestment. Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, the Gulf states have constantly proven themselves reliable energy partners, demonstrating unwavering commitment to stabilizing global energy markets, notably during the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s, some of them undertook exceptional measures, such as reflagging their oil tankers to safeguard the flow of oil despite the danger to their vessels. More recently, the Ukraine war crisis underscored the vital role played by the GCC countries in upholding energy security. Despite formidable challenges that continue to cast a shadow of uncertainty on energy markets, the GCC countries have displayed resilience and maintained the, the continuity and stability of supply. For example, oil and gas trade routes have emerged from the region to Europe and elsewhere. In the same time, or in the same context, it is essential to stress the importance of maintaining the security of waterways, which is one of the vital and fundamental factors in ensuring energy security and at the regional and global level. These corridors form the artery of maritime transport to ensure the flow of energy products to global markets. Any threat or interruptions in these corridors may lead to severe disruption in energy markets. Therefore, countries and international organizations must combine effort to protect these corridors against military threat, piracy, or environmental disaster. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, it is imperative to emphasize the strategic endeavor undertaken by the Gulf countries in blustering energy security, including one, focusing on renewable energy sources, two, robust investment in research and development for sustainable energy solutions, three, fostering energy efficient practices, four, and last, promoting private sector collaboration in joint project. Moreover, the GCC countries acknowledge the importance of traditional energy supplies in the long term to ensure energy security and affordability. Yet, the six member states have also embraced renewable as evident by their respective national development plan. And please allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to highlight some of the GCC countries' major energy plans and projects which can go hand in hand with the 17 new and sustainable development goals, mainly goal number seven, affordable and clean energy, and align with the Paris Agreement. One, the UAE Energy Strategy 2050 targets an energy mix that combines renewable, nuclear, and clean energy sources to meet the UAE economic requirements and environmental goals as follows, 44% of clean energy, 38% gas, and 12% clean coal. Two, Bahrain aims to convert 20% of its energy into renewable energy by 2035 and, and reach zero carbon neutrality by 2060. The plan includes the implementation of solar and wind energy products and aim to generate 5% of the country electricity from renewable sources by 2025. Three, with the commitment to clean energy and sustainability, the, U the Saudi Vision 2035 is leading the charges in tackling energy and climate challenges. The focus is on innovation solutions such as the circular carbon economy and increasingly diverse energy mix, in which 50% of energy will come from renewable sources by 2030. Four, in, tw in 2022, Oman announced a target to achieve net zero emission by 2050 and began reducing fuel fuel, 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 fuel used in the domestic energy mix based on analysis of current global project pipeline. Oman is, is on the track to become the sixth largest exporter of hydrogen globally and the largest in the Middle East by 2030. Five, as for Qatar's national vision 2030, 
it aims to generate 20% of electricity from renewable energy sources by 2030. Six, last but not least, Kuwait has a goal to generate 15% of its total power output from renewable sources by 2035. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, for too long, policymakers in advanced economy have ignored warning from the oil and the gas industry about the lack of investment. Those policymakers have placed much faith on renewable energy sources. Oil and gas investment has significantly declined in the period from 2014 to 2021. Therefore, there is an urgent need to rectify this in order to ensure energy security and plug any gaps. The world needs oil and gas for the foreseeable future to meet expanding demand. This is underscored in OPEC's recently released World Outlook 2023. It sees energy demand expanding by 23% between now and 2045, and with oil and gas still expected to meet over 50% of global energy need by then. For the oil industry alone, OPEC sees investment requirement of $14 trillion out to 2045, or around $610 billion per year. It is vital these are made for consumers, producers, and global economy, and ultimately global energy security. To this end, I would like to end my speech with the, fo with the four following remarks. One, I want to reiterate the urgent need to strengthen international cooperation, including protecting energy infrastructure and transmission routes, as well as confronting potential threat, be they military or cyber related. Two, I want to affirm that a long-term vision is necessary to ensure energy security, irrespective of current conflicts such as Russia-Ukraine war or other short-term challenges. Moreover, fostering cooperation and transparency between pro producers and consumers is crucial to ensure the, sta the stability of oil markets. Three, I want to explain that despite commendable effort by the GCC countries to collaborate as active member of global community, addressing future challenges requires a broad global alliance as any disruption in energy supplies poses threat to all countries irrespective of their development status. Four, and finally, I want to highlight that it is of great significance to recognize that energy security constitute an integral component of national and international security, and any labs on energy security represent a lack of overall security. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Excellency, thank you very much for, for those remarks and listing those uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, concerns, vulnerabilities, plans uh, to, to address them, uh, investment priorities, uh, and, and some of the other steps that, you, that you've outlined um, uh, towards the end. I'm sure people will want to pick up on a number of them. Um, may I now invite uh, Osama Mubaris, the Secretary General of the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, to uh, take the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I would like to start by thanking IISS and the Kingdom of Bahrain for this gracious invitation. It's really a pleasure and honor for me to be amongst this distinguished panel. And I think it's the topic of today about energy and energy security is critical, not just today, but all the time, especially that we are living in a world of a lot of uncertainties. The world has been witnessing for the past four years consecutive challenges and crises, starting by the COVID pandemic, and then the Russia-Ukraine war, an existential climate change challenge, and also the current uh, Israeli-Gaza war, and a very divided and polarized world, not just with what happened in uh, Israel and Hamas, but also this has been going on for a few years. All these challenges have been sweeping the world, changing the norms, 
and the way we have been thinking about doing business and things. And the energy has been in the forefront of all these crises. And there comes the energy trilemma about energy security, energy sustainability, and affordability. And I believe a key word to facing these challenges is collaboration. It has been recurring this morning from His Excellency in his speech and also during yesterday in a lot of speeches. And what I would like to uh, maybe spend in the next few minutes is an example about collaboration and energy, which is the East Mediterranean Gas Forum. Uh, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum is an, a relatively infant organization that has been established almost three years by now. And the whole idea about DMGF is that there are significant gas reserves discoveries in the East Mediterranean. A lot of them are not developed, are not produced. Not just the proven reserves, but a lot of yet to find reserves that are not being able to be explored because the already discovered, uh, the, the already discoveries are not producing. So the whole idea was how can we bring together the different stakeholders from the governments, the industry and the companies together to overcome the challenges of developing these resources. So currently the EMGF has eight member countries. It has Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Italy and France. And we have three observers, the US, the EU and the World Bank. And I think one of the things that distinguishes the EMGF is that it's not just about the governments. We have the governments and we also we have what we call the Gas Industry Advisory Committee, which has about 38 member companies from NOCs, IOCs, financing institutes, technology companies. And I believe by bringing all these stakeholders together, we're trying to, to get all the stakeholders to collaborate to develop the resources. We are trying to work, uh, we have our long-term strategy, which have seven strategic objectives, and we're working on three main pillars. One is the regional integration. How can we make synergies between the different uh, fields and different facilities existing in infrastructure? And also, how can we create a more integrated and interdependent economies between the different countries in the region? And the second pillar is focused on climate change and climate action. And the third pillar is about the positioning of the EMGF as a low-carbon, low-cost gas supplies while engaging the private sector. So what we have been trying to do since our inception is working on these three main pillars. For the uh, regional integration and the supporting the security of supplies, I believe what we managed to do with the support of the different countries and companies is especially after the Russia-Ukraine war, the East Mediterranean was able to increase its supplies, gas supplies to Europe by over 30%. I think this is significant. The East Mediterranean gas resources might be limited or not like the Gulf reserves, but I think for Europe, and especially for Southern and Eastern Europe, is significant and can provide a source of diversification for energy supplies. What we are also trying to do is how can we strike the balance between energy security and energy transition and climate change. Both challenges are significant. We have seen the severe weather conditions all over the world, so no one now is debating the climate challenge. But at the same time, energy security is also important. Without security of energy, it is threatening not just the... Uh, better lives, but it is threatening the livelihoods of everyone. And I believe, although some people think that energy security is a short term and energy transition is a long term, both energy security and energy transition and climate change should be both short and long term. What we are trying to do is that last year we launched the decarbonization initiative of the East Mediterranean with an objective, how can we reduce emissions from the gas industry in the region? We managed to launch this during the COP27 that took place in Egypt last year, and we will be presenting during COP28 that will take place in UAE, our, what we are doing now. 
What we did last year is we tried, we tried to set the baseline of the emissions of the gas industry and also what are the efforts and the projects that we can do to reduce emissions and we managed to set two plans. An outline for projects that can be done to reduce decarbonization and another plan, what are the policies and regulations required to encourage the investment in these projects. And we identified also in this initiative five main roles for the EMGF to do. Something to do about harmonization of policies, technology aggregation, supporting the financing, and carbon certification. What we're doing now is we're focusing more on two main things. Harmonization of policies and regulations to drive further the decarbonization, and also trying to set a mechanism for carbon intensity certification for the region that DMGF would adopt and also be an uh, accredited uh, carbon certifier. We'll be presenting this during the COP28, and I think we are managing this through the support of not just our member countries, but also a lot of other companies and organizations as well. So, although it might be a little bit challenging to talk about collaboration, especially in these crises, but I think we need to think beyond the current crisis. We need to think beyond the uh, short term and think more about the long term. What can we do to enhance the collaboration? What can we do to diversify and support the diversification of energy, but in a manner that is more responsible and setting the low carbon and low cost supplies of energy, taking into consideration the climate challenge as a priority, as well as energy security. Thank you. Thank you very much. The security, sustainability, affordability as the framework you then, the, the example of cooperation uh, that you gave EMGF uh, and the pillars of activity, I think, I think are, are really very interesting and I think people might have questions about how, how, how much potential there is, um, how far one can push this, and where it might take us. Thank you very much. Amos Hochstein, please, if I may invite you to take the floor. Good morning, Manama Dialogue. Uh, it's great to be here, and thank you to the Kingdom of Bahrain and uh, to the organizers for having, again, uh, an excellent conference that uh, everybody has this on their calendars every year for the Manama Dialogue, when the Manama Dialogue is. So it, is, it has lived up to its uh, very high reputation, and I'm very glad to be here today. I'm also very glad that you've included an energy security topic as energy security has always been, but sometimes not recognized, as a critical pillar of national security and global security. And that's true here in the Middle East, it's true in the United States, and it's true globally. And it's true especially during a period of time when we are going through two military conflicts that directly link or indirectly link into energy markets. Uh, one, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, conducted by third largest oil producer in the world, an important gas producer and exporter, uh, and uh, the current uh, war uh, resulting from the terrorist attacks on October 7 and the resulting war in Gaza, devastating civilian casualties on both sides um, and having impacts on how do we think about energy cooperation and collaboration in the context of a conflict that could widen uh, in a region that is so important to global economic security. So let's take a step back and see where are we on what is the current picture on energy, what is the United States view as the role of the global community uh, when it comes to energy developments, energy security, and how it fits into uh, what we see as the future. There are two things that we need to do at the same time in parallel. And one is to accelerate the energy transition as aggressively as possible with the uh, global climate change risk being a more and more real risk to populations around the world, to economic security around the world, to investment uh, as we see the increases effects of climate change uh, becoming more extreme 
on every year that passes. At the same time, we have to manage the energy transition. Energy tra the word transition means that we're not there yet. We are still in that process. And to do that, we have to manage the energy system of the world today. And that means we are going to have fossil fuel with us for a while, for a significant while longer. And even when it peaks, people talk about peak oil, peak gas demand. Peak doesn't mean it goes away. It means demand for it doesn't grow anymore, and then it goes through a long period of decline. And it may even plateau for a while. So we need to make sure that there's enough fossil fuel supply on the market during this energy transition to ensure against energy shocks that lead to economic shocks that are, led, that are caused by higher inflation as we saw that cycle play out in the past. So those have to interplay with each other. In the United States, President Biden has uh, put the energy transition as one of the most critical part of his domestic agenda. And the IRA passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the IRA, the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, all those are names of legislation. But what they have done is shown that governments can accelerate investment, can change the flow of capital towards energy. And that has surprised us even on the upside to the level of how much money has been invested over the last year in the energy transition. We believe that that should happen elsewhere around the world. Now, ironically or not, one place where that's happening more than any other place around the world is right here in the Gulf, uh, where UAE and Saudi and Qatar and others are investing in that very same thing. And what does that mean? That means that energy cooperation during this period of conflict means that we have to have more connectivity, more cooperation and understanding between the United States and producers around the world, in this region and around the world, while also working for the first time with the same partners that we work on oil supply and ensuring natural gas supply on how do we work together to invest in the energy transition. And I think that the COP28 being hosted here in this region in an oil producing country gives us that moment of opportunity of bringing together the fossil fuel industry and climate advocates to say, how do we work together? How does the fossil fuel industry come to the world and say, we get it, we understand that the world is changing and we are going to A, decarbonize and B, we are going to spend more of our capex, more of our capital expenditure on getting to invest in our own disruption, if you will, and invest in not just decarbonization, but investing in becoming energy companies, not just oil companies. And so to do that, we have to invest in the actual renewables and clean energy and in the supply chains. But the critical piece that we have to not miss, because if we do, we will affect national global security is the issue of energy, energy justice. And we have seen the number, the percentage of dollars spent on the energy transition outside of the OECD in developing and middle-income countries go down instead of up over the last several years. And if you want to talk about a link between energy security and hard physical security of military security and diplomatic security, widening this gap is a threat to global security. We cannot have massive investments in a new energy system around the world while a part of the world is not getting any of those dollars and is being, will be left behind in the energy system. That is true in digital, it is true in 5G, it is true in AI, and it has to be also true and critically true in energy. So the energy security question has never been and never should have been about oil and gas versus renewables. It's about security of supply. It's about ensuring that conflicts don't impede it, that people don't weaponize it. But it is also true today that as we go through this massive transformation around the world, that everyone has to benefit from it. If the global south and developing and middle-income countries don't have those investments, that is gonna to lead to conflict, not here in the Middle East, but around the world. So that's where we have to come together as a global community, the Middle East as 
producing countries and consuming countries around the world to figure out how do we make that investment. And I think the transformation that's happened over the last two, three years is an example of how we can do that. We have, you know, every time I go to Saudi Arabia, there are headlines about, was the, did, they, did they discuss OPEC? We spend more time discussing how to invest in global supply chains for clean energy than we do about oil supply. It may not make as good a headline, but it is what we actually spend more time talking about. And that's what we have to do if we are going to be able to secure energy supply chains. And energy security at the end of the day is about securing supply and making sure it is available and affordable and allows for economic growth. Let me close on one statement that my colleagues talked about, and that's the issue of connectivity. For the last 15 years, what we've seen in this region in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean is connectivity. The connection, the EMGF, which the East Med Gas Forum, which the United States and I have urged that we change it from gas forum to energy forum, is about how do we use physical integration, physical connection with pipelines and electricity lines to ensure not just prosperity and better efficiency, but actually political connectivity. And I think there's great opportunity if we see what happened in the East Med from Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, connecting the East Med to Jordan through two major pipelines. That is the vision of the future, not just for gas, but that is the vision of the future of if you want to produce clean energy in the Middle East and the Gulf is probably the cheapest place to do it, probably in the world, but it's a trapped and captured market. But if it connects through Egypt, through Israel to Europe, those are the trade routes for electricity connectivity that can provide not just prosperity, but the kind of military and diplomatic connectivity that will support this region and connect the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Amos Hochstein. Um, uh, first of all, by starting off with giving a very clear answer to the question that some people might have had, is the energy transition moving fast enough? You're saying definitely not. Um, uh, and uh, you then uh, framed the energy security uh, challenge, and I think uh, uh, in a very engaging way, and, and there's lots to dig into there around uh, uh, connectivity, energy justice, so I hope people do pick that up. Um, may I now turn uh, to, last but not least, to Thanos Dokos, please to take the floor and deliver your remarks. Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, being part of the Manama Dialogue and um, addressing such a distinguished audience is, is a privilege, and I would like to thank both the Kingdom of Bahrain and the AAAS for the invitation. So I will try to focus, uh, I will focus my, my remarks on my own neighborhood, which is the Eastern Mediterranean, and try to be complementary to the other speakers, which is always a challenge for the last speaker in a panel. Um, and I will try to answer the question whether energy discoveries have been a facilitator for peace uh, or just another cause of conflict. And if, and if not, can that be changed? So Ukraine has been a painful reminder that um, monopolies and oligopolies are not ideal situations if you are the buyer. And the Ukraine conflict um, highlighted the importance of energy security and energy diversification and underlined the significance of East Med hydrocarbon discoveries, um, which of course have not been a game changer, at least as far as um, current discoveries are concerned, but there is potential for additional discoveries. But they have been a welcome addition to our list of dependable suppliers. Now, um, have they been a catalyst for peace? The, um, the record is mixed. Uh, it hasn't been the case for Greece, Cyprus and Turkey, uh, at least um, not yet although I must say the mood is more positive nowadays. Uh, the situation between Israel and Lebanon changed because of the efforts of certain people. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that change uh, will remain. 
Egypt and most of Israel's discoveries uh, were not affected by regional uh, problems, uh, mainly because of geography. Now, given that the security environment is expected to deteriorate further before it gets any better, if it does, uh, you know, we're back to the perennial um, basic scenarios. Is it going to be competition and confrontation leading to conflict and fragmentation, or cooperation and connectivity leading to integration and peace? Well, we have, it was mentioned that we have a number of urgent needs, like to bring um, energy to European markets, today hydrocarbons uh, through pipelines or LNGs or FSIUs, and tomorrow it will be about green energy. Now, can that be, can, can energy make a contribution to regional stability? I think the answer is yes, it's probably a Herculean task but it's not impossible. And pragmatism, of course, is essential. We need to try to change the, uh, the mentality from zero-sum, which is often lose-lose, to win-win. And to do that, I think we need flagship projects, which need to be realistic, economically viable, they have to respect sovereignty uh, and international law of the sea, uh, but they have to... Um, also bring benefits to all sides involved, so we need to think out of the box, and of course we are going to need a lot of goodwill. Just let me give, me, uh, le let me give you just a few examples. You know, electricity, cables, interconnectors, uh, we have uh, under, underway EuroAsia, EuroAfrica bringing green energy, hydrogen tomorrow from uh, North Africa and the, uh, and the Gulf region. One can also think about corridors for goods and energy uh, from all the way from Asia, from India, through the Gulf and to the Eastern Med. And, and Greece is trying to position itself as a hub or an entry point uh, for the European markets. Now, let me, um, before I get to my um, most important ingredient into that mix of um, pieces that need to fall into place to make such projects doable. Uh, let me open a very quick mental parenthesis and say that what is also mit missing from the Eastern Med is a regional security architecture. And perhaps the uh, Eastern Med Natural Gas Forum, or whatever the uh, future name may be, is a good example, a good model of a coalition of like-minded countries who believe in win-win win, win, uh, solutions. And it's very interesting that both Israel and Palestine are members uh, to the forum. Uh, also, we have a plethora of uh, trilateral partnerships uh, in the Eastern Med and the Gulf region with Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, India may be a future participant, and one can think of various combinations of how things could be um, expanded, and it should be a, an open-ended process. Uh, but my, uh, my, we also need, and it was mentioned, um, more uh, protection and resilience of our uh, land and underwater infrastructure. There will be multiple threats from state and non-state actors, so resilience uh, will be an important priority for all of us. And finally, leadership. We need moderates and visionaries, like those very senior people from the region, starting with the Crown Prince, that we had the privilege of listening to uh, during the, the last two days. Uh, we need people like uh, Amos Hostein, who are very good at the implementation part, you know, who getting things done, which is always very important. And we need back those voices that led the Israelis and the Palestinians to the Oslo peace process and who prepared the, the, the Geneva uh, Initiative, voices that have been silenced and marginalized over the past 10, 15 years. And finally, um, we need some guidance from the spirits of Yitzhak Rabin and Anwar Sadat, uh, who were fully aware of the potential personal cost yet they chose 
to do the right thing uh, for their countries and their people. Thank you. Anas, thank you very much uh, for, for your remarks and for outlining some of the ingredients uh, that will be required to make sure that energy does contribute to, to stability. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, 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 place that positive um, uh, part. Uh, we will now um, turn to uh, questions um, from, the, from the audience. We have a long list already of uh, people um, seeking the floor. Um, we're approaching 20, so uh, I'll take a first batch and we'll return to, to the panel to provide a first set of answers. We'll then take a second batch. We'll see how, how far we can get. Um, uh, also a reminder, please, if you can, focus on one point, ask a question, um, uh, 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 and be, be precise. So let me start with uh, from Oman and the um, IISS Young Leaders Group, uh, Fatma Al-Arimi. Your microphone is live now. Thank you, and I really hope to get an answer for my question today because I didn't get it yesterday. <laughs> okay, my question is, the GCC countries have proven to be able to continue economic ties uh, in the energy, electricity networks and gas pipelines, despite political um, disagreements. We've seen that in the Gulf crisis in 2017, where the gas pipeline from Qatar to Alfin continued to pump gas across the GCC. Um, my question is, to what extent can such collaboration that clearly represents business diplomacy be expanded beyond the GCC to uh, other countries connected by land to the Arabian Peninsula? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I will now turn to John Chipman, Executive Chairman of the ISS. Well, thank you very much. Last October, uh, the maritime border between Israel and Lebanon was finally uh, delineated. It's a delight to have on stage uh, one of the principal architects of that uh, arrangement. I know at the time that the then Israeli National Security Advisor Ayel Hulata uh, thought that that de uh, delineation and agreement would help to create economic incentives to maintain a measure of peace uh, as between those two countries. Two questions then. One, uh, given the present conflict, do you believe that the deal will be honored? And secondly, insofar as no gas has been found on the Lebanese side of that maritime border, though there remains one block still to properly investigate, uh, how will that affect acceptance of the border that has been delineated? John, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, next from Egypt, uh, Shatwa Esmat. Um, thank you so much. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first question is that there have been two keywords that have mentioned energy security along with energy justice, and they are dependent on each other. So my question now, how the world is putting the plan to enable the global south or developing countries to make sure that they are not left behind. So especially when they do not have enough uh, investment to invest in clean energy. Uh, my second question, um, how the current conflict um, in Gaza might affect the work of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum? I know that there have been talks about that we need to think about long-term plans, but how about considering the current conflict, how that might affect uh, the collaboration in the forum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's very good. Shatra Esmat, also from the Young Leaders Group, I should have said. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I'll take two more, and then I will return to the panel for for first uh, set of answers. Uh, uh, Ragida Darkan, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Thomas, you have come from Lebanon, it seems, in the last few days. You were in Lebanon and Israel. What uh, did you conclude that that front now is quiet uh, temporarily, transitionally, or do you have any ingredients for a lasting 
uh, arrangement, uh, given that Iran has been speaking a different language recently. And uh, um, just also in terms of Israel, people are always afraid that it's the, Israel, it's the Hezbollah and uh, Iran that may make this a wider war, whereas there is a very strong feeling in many quarters in Lebanon and beyond that the fear is really from Israel wanting to pull in the U.S. Into, to its side to get rid of Hezbollah's uh, missiles and etc. Uh, have you been able to lean on the Israelis in a very permanent way and uh, that's it, you're not going to do it uh, through Hezbollah or are you still worried that this might get out of hand? Thank you very much. And final question in this round uh, from Sam Dagger. Thank you. Um, I mean, Sir, Sir John already asked part of my question, and uh, those are the follow-up from uh, Ragida as well. I would just add also that the Jordanian parliament is currently apparently reviewing uh, the 2016 gas deal with Israel. So how does that and uh, um, some of the, I mean, the Israeli threats to Lebanon's uh, quote-unquote uh, returning Lebanon to the stone age of Hezbollah intervenes, how does that perhaps impact the deal that you were involved in, uh, and how does it impact uh, future projects uh, if, if we have a prolonged conflict here? Thank you. Can I start with you? Thank you very much. We'll, we'll go back to the panel now for, for a set of responses to this. I'll actually ask Amos to, to start off this round, if that's all right. Amos, please. Yeah. Um, so let me start with um, the person who felt that her question wasn't answered yesterday, <laughs> um, so that I start with that. Um, look, I think you're right. There's a reason that connectivity, that Dolphin Pipeline did not get affected during the conflict, and that is, that is part of what I was trying to suggest earlier. When you build infrastructure, physical connectivity between countries, it's not only that it supports it in peacetime by making, creating efficiencies, but it also creates an additional cost of conflict that countries have to worry about. It suddenly means that the cost of conflict is not just on the human cost, which is countries somehow are willing to take, but it also means that there's going to be a, a price cost to when you have a pipeline and you cut it off, then you are the, you're, it's a relationship that will cost you the replacement cost, which will always be higher. And that's why more integration, more physical interconnection, more codependency between countries and regions creates more interdependency, that then leads to more security. I firmly believe that, and I think in many conflicts that we've seen, there's a hesitancy to stop those connections. So I believe not just in the physical infrastructure in this region in the Gulf, but actually connecting uh, the Gulf into the wider global market is going to have that effect as well. So again, I think you can produce very cheap renewable energy in uh, in almost every country in this Gulf. It's been blessed with sun and wind uh, and cheap uh, manufacturing and infrastructure production. And therefore, it could connect those wires, subsea cables, as was discussed before by my colleagues, all the way to Europe in an efficient manner, which also will create that stability. So I do believe that those, those connections are possible and advisable. Uh, there were a number of questions on Lebanon, but let me get first to the question about the energy transition and energy justice. I think your question is exactly right. How do you get to a point of the Global South getting the investment that it needs? And right now, the percentage of the dollars, I think, went from 27 cents on the dollar to non-OECD to about 22 cents on the dollar. So it's going in the wrong direction. So what, we, what needs to be done is that the multilateral development banks, uh, sovereign wealth funds, governments uh, and industry need to be putting together structures of finance to lower the cost of capital because the risk of investing in lower and middle income countries right now doesn't allow those investments to happen. There is currency risk, there is reputational risk and corruption risk, and there's so much money around, but there are also so many projects. So it's easier to invest in Denmark or Cleveland. So why would I go to a country where I have a higher risk on return? And therefore, the banks don't charge me a premium. So we need to bring that cost of capital down as a global community. And those are the conversations I'm having ahead of COP, and I'm hoping that COP will bring about some change there. We are uh, 
trying to put more money. We have invested uh, several billion dollars just this past year because President Biden wants to do pipelines in Angola and DRC and Zambia and working in Southeast Asia and certain parts of Central America to make the infrastructure costs, which is the hardest part, more affordable so that we incentivize the business. We can't do it on charity and development assistance. We have to do it on a sustainable basis, and that means it has to be profitable, but the governments, but the companies are not doing it. So what we, our job as government needs to be to come and say, okay, I will take the first loss. I'll take the riskiest part of the investment, smaller dollars, and bring in to allow the incentivizing of bringing in the companies to come and make those investments. And I, I think COP is a great place for us to uh, accelerate this process, but it's something that is urgently needed. On Lebanon, look, I think my, uh, to write, write a, my, my trip to Lebanon was about, um, was not about the gas fields or anything like that. It was about right now, we cannot afford an escalation of this conflict into another front. And my conversations in Lebanon mirror the conversations we're having in Israel as well. Of utmost importance is to ensure that the Gaza war does not spread to Lebanon. The Lebanese people do not need to be at risk of going to war. Israeli population should live in security in their northern towns on their side of the border, and the Lebanese people have the right to live in security on their side of the border. And yes, we have violence now. Uh, it is relatively measured uh, and contained. We have to keep it that way. It's in no one's interest to do that. That is what we have said. We are not going to be dragged into war anywhere. And the sides need to, we have to think about how do we ensure security for both sides of the border. And I don't believe that it takes a war to get there. And so uh, I think the Lebanese people are overwhelmingly uninterested in going to war. Uh, and I think that that should stay that way. And we're going to do everything we can. Regarding the, the maritime deal, look, people called it a gas deal. At the end of the day, it was a maritime deal. It allowed it, for the very first time, created a border recognized by the UN between two countries that do not have diplomatic relations. One doesn't recognize the mere existence of the other, that have spent more wars between those two countries than any other two in the Middle East, and over the last 75 years. And that was the achievement there. What it enabled was for a international major company, oil major as in Total, to invest a significant amount of money in sending a exploratory drill rig to the water, something that it would not have done absent an agreement. And I will say that the, the look, if you're from this region, everybody here knows oil and gas in this region. You don't just say, oh, we drilled one hole, it was dry, it was a total failure, we're never going to get it again. Everybody knows in this industry that it takes time and development and you, uh, there's a 10% of drilling to success. So there's going to be more exploration. The drill rig is still there while rockets are flying. And no rockets have flown in the water from Lebanon to Israel and vice versa during this period of time where hundreds of rockets have flown. So I would say that so far, that part of the agreement is, is, has been kept. But I don't want, for those who say, look, we did the maritime agreement, you all said this is going to lead to peace, and look, there's violence. I don't think anybody a year ago said that a maritime agreement between Israel and Lebanon was going to solve uh, eternal peace uh, in this area, while Hezbollah is still uh, in control of 150,000 rockets and a border that is not settled on the land boundary that is still unsettled and still, still in dispute. So, but it, what it did give us is a roadmap for what can be done in the future to get to a place, not today, uh, but after this war, maybe this is the moment of starting to think of what is a vision of this region without, with less conflict. Not without conflict, but with less conflict. I'll take that for starters. Thank you very much for those answers. Thanos, if I can uh, turn to you next. Well, I would like to echo the, um, the concern about Lebanon. Uh, we witnessed firsthand the, um, the consequences of the Lebanese civil war. We still have a, uh, a very dynamic Lebanese community uh, in Greece. 
Uh, this country has been especially fragile after the, uh, the big explosion at the uh, port of Beirut, has also been uh, feeling the impact of the, of the Syrian conflict, <coughs> still a, a very large, in terms of proportions, number of uh, Syrian, Syrian refugees. So the last thing the, the Lebanese people is another war. They have suffered enough, so we need to do everything we can to keep them out of this conflict. Um, I'm all for physical connectivity, uh, it, it makes a contribution in preventing a conflict. Uh, you know, perhaps few people know that uh, there has been a, uh, a pipeline between Greece and Turkey has not been affected by any bilateral problems. Of course, um, I hope that the uh, EU, Europe, Russia um, um, problems have been an exception to the rule because after a conflict breaks out, then it's a different situation. But physical connectivity is important. And, and lastly, climate change. And this is a region where we have uh, lots of uh, interstate uh, differences, some of them real, some perceived, you know, ideological, geopolitical. But one thing we all agree that we need to cooperate on is climate change. Uh, and it is really a common problem. Just to give an example, there was extensive flooding uh, in Greece uh, over the summer. The storm that caused the flooding moved on to Libya and caused a significant number of casualties. So it's a common problem. Uh, perhaps let's seize the opportunity uh, to COP is, is a bigger initiative, but let's uh, explore the idea of regional initiatives based on climate change so that we can build some goodwill and, and, and trust between the, uh, the, the countries in the region. Thomas, thank you very much. Uh, Osama Mubaris, do you want to pick up some, some of these themes? And there were a few that you yeah, think have you. a specific... I think one of the questions was about the impact of the current conflict on the EMGF. And I think uh, uh, what we are trying to do is that, as uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the previous speech, about whether can we make energy, in this case gas, a catalyst for peace, and avert the classical view about energy as a, con a fuel for conflict. I think this is what we're trying to do. We're not always successful, but what we're trying to do is how can we make, how can we create value from the resources in the region? How can we increase this value and how can we make a piece of this value to everyone? This is to some extent happening, for instance, between Israel, Jordan, Egypt and uh, Europe. Gas from Israel is going to Egypt through Jordan and then re-exported to Europe. Going to Europe through mainly through Greece, so it's, there is a value to, to everyone. So are we able to do this to, to all the region? This is what we're trying to do. But definitely conflicts can, make, can hinder some of the projects. But once the project is there, as Amos was saying, it's quite difficult to go away from it. One of the examples is the Dolphin Pipeline between Qatar and UAE during the political conflict. This was still going. It never stopped. So I think with projects that has value to all the stakeholders, we can stand some of the conflicts. But we will never be able to uh, remove conflicts all uh, Thank you very much. Great, let's take a, a second round of uh, questions and, and comments from the floor. Before I go there though, I should, I should say, and I think some of you have seen it, that uh, a, a preview of the forthcoming ISS strategic dossier on the Eastern Mediterranean has been made available to participants and that's a good example of ISS research, uh, policy relevant research in, in that particular uh, area. So let me, uh, ask a few, for a few more interventions. Uh, first, uh, Maha Ghazi from Morocco and the Young Leaders Group. Maha. Your hello, hello everyone. Yep. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the trans transitional um, uh, period that you talked about, uh, Mr. Uh, Hosten. Um, you say that uh, the fuel suppliers pair, it's supposed to be in this transition for a longer time. 
uh, then we we can do this tra transition. How long th does it take? What are the challenges of this uh, uh, transition? And uh, do you think in the renewable uh, energy, for example, I can see that the market uh, or even the, the climate action tracker, uh, the indicators that talk about the efforts uh, of uh, the renewable energy in the in the MENA region. Uh, I can see the Emirat or other Gulf countries now are investing a lot for this renewable energy. But at the same time, I can see that Morocco is hidden uh, very, uh, they are in, in the top in Africa. They, they are uh, now uh, in competition a little bit with uh, the African, uh, the uh, North, uh, North Africa, uh, sorry, uh, South Africa. And uh, do you think uh, that in the MENA region, uh, and my question is for the, the whole, anyone uh, from the panel, do you think uh, this, the, the good uh, efforts that Morocco is doing f with Gulf countries is a competition or a good ally uh, or a good uh, like a partnership? And uh, are MENA region now seeking uh, especially Gulf countries are seeking new partnerships with non-classical or non-traditional uh, tradition markets. And uh, the private sector, uh, does it have a role in, uh, in uh, the Gulf countries uh, in, uh, in the renewable energy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert Ward. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, a question to the panel. Uh, the G7 plus crude oil price cap is nearly a year old. The refined products price cap is, has its first anniversary in February next year. What impact, structural or political, have these caps had on the oil or broader energy markets? Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, if I can please ask uh, uh, Basima Halawi Ro next. Thank you. My question to Special Envoy Amas. Uh, Iran, every time in a time of conflict, always a threat to close the Strait of Hormuz. And last week, the Houthi, they are imitating the Iranian behavior. They are threatening to attack the Israeli ship and also close the Babel Mandeb Strait, which will endanger the energy security. My, my question to you, how the U.S. and its ally will respond to this threat that will endanger the energy security? Thank you. Thank you very much. And from Kuwait and uh, the Young Leaders Group, Ahmad Salmin. Good morning. Thank you. One of the major accomplishments of COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh is the Loss and Damage Fund, LDF. With that in mind, what are the likelihood that developed nations will contribute to the fund, especially when the panel has mentioned that we cannot leave anyone behind? And do you think parties participating in COP28 will separate political disagreements on global and regional challenges and tackle the issue of emission reduction and decarbonization? Thank you. Thank you very much. Baria. Alamuddin. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Amos. You're the godfather of the maritime agreement, uh, sir, and you talk about security and justice. Will Lebanon ever see such a thing? Because you know this area is in very short supply of both security and justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Emmett. Uh, thank you, Bastian. I, I would like to further lower the tone by introducing economics uh, to the conversation and asking more about the oil price. Um, this, of course, would be better with Mr. Al Budaiwi here, but um, I wonder if I could ask the panel to reflect upon the impact of the oil price on the issues that you are discussing. Um, it, the general view of oil producers, of course, is that they keep the oil price stable, although consumers feel that it means stably high and generally steadily rising. Um, and th what imp this, of course, has had an impact on incentivizing investment in renewables and adaptation in Europe, but it also affects the energy justice question and is a transfer of funds away from developed nations um, 
who are otherwise being asked to contribute to the loss and damage fund as, be, as has been described. So what impact does the oil price have and what are your um, expectations? Bill, thank you very much. Mina al Oraibi from the UAE. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hochstein, I'd like to ask you about borders, since, as you said, the uh, deal between Lebanon and Israel at its heart was a maritime border deal. One of the things Dr. Anwar Gergash spoke of yesterday was the importance that Israel has recognizable borders with all its neighbors. Is that something that you can advocate for? How do you see the possibility of a future peace in the region with very specific borders for Israel? And also, you spoke of the importance of not using fuel or energy as a weapon of war. What would you say to the situation in Gaza at the moment with only a very small trickle of fuel coming in to Gaza at a time when people need it for every aspect of their lives? Thank you very much. I'm going to take uh, two more from our Young Leaders group. Uh, Noor al Subair from Oman. Yeah, so my question is to Mr. Mubarez. So the East Mediterranean gas firm has been referred to as a talking shop, so a place for leaders to come together and take pictures and not take concrete plans um, to address the finance or like actually developing plans to help the region. So how do you respond to this and what are your opinions on this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sabar Al Sabar from Kuwait. Thank you. This is just a follow-on to Mr. Ward's uh, question regarding price caps. Uh, modern oil market history suggests that large producers operated under this implicit uh, framework that they had energy security immunity. Um, so my question is, is there such a thing as too big to sanction? Thank you. Okay, very good. Let's uh, return to the panel, and if we have a bit of time left, we'll, we'll take a few more uh, to round out the, the session. Um, and was, I think there was a, a slight uh, uh, focus on you for uh, uh, the majority of the questions, so I'll ask you to start again, um, uh, and, then, and then we'll, take, uh, we'll take to, uh, get to the other two panelists. Uh, and there were a few questions that, of course, were addressed to the panel as a whole, um, and a particular one also to uh, Osama. But uh, Amos, why don't you kick off? I'll just run these through the order of my taking quick notes. Um, if I missed anything, just please let me know. Uh, I, I think that the first question was about Morocco and, and the, the, you asked how long is the transition? I wish I knew. Um, I, I think our job is, what we have to do is to break down from, in order to get to real tra energy transition acceleration, is to get away from the politics of energy transition and to get to the functionality of it. And what we're trying to do is essentially unplug the world from an energy system and plug it into another one. That's really, really hard. And the energy systems are a complex web of interconnected um, streams of, uh, uh, of systems that have to seamlessly interplay with each other in order to work. And we've built them over uh, 120 years or so. And to do that, we have to get away from the accusations and look at what do we need to do? We need to have more electric vehicles in order to replace uh, fuel uh, consumption as gasoline. To do that, we have to have a whole supply chain that is there to manufacture the vehicles and the batteries at a, at a cost affordable way. We have to have more renewable energy that can replace gas and coal. We have to have, to do that, we have to build a lot of panels and a lot of wind turbines. Uh, to, uh, to achieve that, uh, we have to have uh, better technology in battery storage because obviously the sun doesn't shine at night and it doesn't, the wind doesn't always blow, so we have to be able to connect these dots. That takes a long time. I think the Gulf is doing a lot of work on taking advantage of its natural resources, which is thought of as oil and gas, but should be sun and wind. I think Morocco is actually taking a leadership position outside the Gulf, and really I, I, I have a lot of praise for what the government of Morocco is doing uh, to try to position it on renewable energy, because it is an investment at the beginning, but it is really carries a lot of, of uh, benefits at the end. Um, there was a question about the G7 price cap and the impacts on, on, on the markets. 
and I'll combine that with the uh, with the question at the end about too big to too big to sanction. Uh, look, the point of the price cap was not to sanction oil, not to take oil off the market, but was to uh, take away the ability of Putin, who is directly using oil and gas revenues to finance a war machine, and. There's a conundrum here where we need the supply, but we don't want him to have the profits. And so the price cap was there to keep the flow of oil on the market so that the consumers around the world are not paying the cost, while at the same time reducing uh, the price and the revenue that Putin was getting. It was enormously successful in the first many months of it going into operation, although predicted that it would fail. Uh, but then it ran into some difficulties as traders and some Russian shadow companies started figuring out how to work around it. And now we're in the process of responding to that and um, and seeing how we can bring the price back up again, up, down again, uh, to reflect that discount between the price of global oil Brent and what the euro's price, the Russian price, is at that time. I think that we're... Uh, we've done two things at the same time. One is the price of oil is now down, so we're not at 95 as it was in September. It's at $80. That's a huge uh, decline in oil price. That has also widened the discount that Russia is getting and that Iran is getting. And it's now back down towards that price cap uh, that we had put together. But the Treasury Department in the United States, working together with the EU, uh, is working towards ensuring that we accommodate for the the uh, things that were, you know, so those parts of the market that were getting around the price gap. So I've, I have confidence that we'll be back to, uh, to compliance while also making sure that the price is there, which leads me to, uh, I'm going to skip around here, to the oil price impact um, that, was, that was asked. Look, I think oil prices are uh, a feature of national security because they are a feature of economic security. If you are a country, if you're India, uh, and you are a major importer of almost all the fuel that you use for an economy that is one of the fastest growing economies with one of the largest populations, then an increase from $80 to $100 is a massive increase in expenditures uh, on your budget. And so the price of oil could have a major impact on global inflation and on consumer confidence and therefore economic output and activity. There is a band in which we have to all accept that producers, yes, you make more money when the price is significantly higher, but when it goes over a certain point, it will necessarily slow down global economic growth and will accelerate the transition away from the fuel. So, uh, you know, Tom Friedman wrote an article 20 years ago called Bring on $200 Oil because he thought that would get us to renewables. I think that was a gross misunderstanding of how transitions work. Just because oil is expensive doesn't mean you suddenly have an electric vehicle and chargers all over the place to transition to. Uh, but there is an, that, that the basic point of the incentives, uh, I think, are there. So oil prices are, are really important. Uh, switching to uh, the Iranian threats and the, and the Houthi threats in the uh, closure of Hormuz and Bab al-Mandab, uh, look, at the end of the day, this threat has been with us for decades. I think this, the United States and uh, Gulf governments and the global community have been very clear that shutting that down is unacceptable. Uh, and that message to both Iran and its proxies uh, in, in Yemen and elsewhere uh, know that that is a red line that, that, uh, uh, that could cause all kinds of damage to the global economy uh, and is not acceptable, something that I'm not going to go into any details of what that means, but we're... This is not a new threat. It has been with us for, for a very long time. Uh, on, I, I do want to touch again on, on the loss and damage and justice. It was raised a number of times, and I'll let my other panelists talk about it more. I'm just going to say, look, at the end of the day, I'm not going to go into the negotiations that are ongoing on, uh, from COP27 to COP28 on loss and damage. But I think that we have to focus less on the politics and the big banners and the demonstrations on, on the past and look at how do we drive capital. This is not about giving handouts. It's about how do we incentivize commercial spending. If we don't make it commercial, you can build it and then there will be no money for maintenance or upkeep and it will just be a relic just like everything else we've seen for the last 100 years of, in developing countries when it was just 
a development project. It doesn't work. If you build electricity systems or dams that don't make money, then the donor goes away after it's built and nobody is there to make sure it continues to work. We have to make this about concessional lending, about cap returns, about making sure that the cost of the capital is lower and that companies and commercial banks are there to make those investments. That is what's going to drive growth. Second, we have to make sure there are high standards. So these debt traps and use of child labor and where com local communities are not benefiting from the investment, that just doesn't work either. And we've seen that in, the, in some of the Chinese investments where 10 years later, they've gotten all the extraction of copper and cobalt and lithium and the community living around them has been are as poor as they were the day that that investment started. That has to change by insisting on high labor standards, environmental standards, and making sure that these reflect our values and growth for the community so we can have economic growth, not just, we're not there to provide electricity. <clears throat> we're there to, to make sure that there's growth of, econ of the economy uh, in the local community. I'll uh, leave, I, I know there was an issue of recognizable borders. I think Anwar Gargash is 100% right. Uh, Israel should have recognizable borders um, as, by the way, that's not unique to Israel. I think every country should have recognizable borders with its neighbors. It tends to help with security. Uh, I think that's as true with uh, when we talk about a two-state solution and Palestine and Israel living side by side as it does between Israel and, and Lebanon having a recognized border, inshallah, someday, uh, if we can make that all happen. And I think crises are usually... Uh, uh, while terrible, also an opportunity to try to get uh, movement on things that were static and stagnant before the crisis. Was, thank you very much. Osama, the Secretary General, can I please ask you, you had one direct challenge put to you, but you might want to put on, uh, put, put, uh, 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 look into uh, a couple of the other questions. As well. Thank you, yes. thank you. So, um, the MJF is, a, is newly established, it's almost two or three years. What we managed it to do since then is that we developed and approved the long-term strategy from our ministers. We have seven strategic objectives. As I said, the three pillars that we're working on are the regional integration. What we did in this regard is that we issued uh, five reports, five studies about the supply demand in the region and how what's the competition or let's say the other sources that we're competing with and how can the EMGF or the East Mediterranean supply or be part of one of the diversification sources of Europe. What we did in this regard is that we already have several options for the uh, infrastructure to be used to develop the resources, capitalizing first on the existing uh, infrastructure that Egypt have and the connections between e Israel and Egypt and Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, and also how can we capitalize or develop the resources in Cyprus? We developed several options. Now the Cyprus government is discussing with the companies their development plan connecting Aphrodite to Egypt. So uh, I'm not saying that the EMGF did all of this, but we we managed to facilitate these discussions with the companies and also we managed to finalize the plans and put it forward to the companies and also to the countries. And as I said, one of the main milestones in this regard, accelerating supplies, is increasing gas supplies from the region to Europe last year by 30% in a very critical time that really Europe needed. The other track is, I think, and it has been discussed a lot about climate change and climate action and the balance between energy security and energy transition. And maybe to, to start with is that to comment about the energy transition, we cannot talk about one energy transition. We need, we need to talk about energy transitions. Each country, each region should have its own span and also the portfolio, how they manage this transition. We cannot talk about African countries, like European countries, like OECD countries and others. Even within Africa, we have some countries that have oil and gas resources, others don't have these resources. So each country should have a different but aligned energy transition. To go back to the, what we are do, trying to do with the energy transition at the EMGF, as I said, we already launched the EMGF decarbonization strategy. 
we set what's the baseline of the emissions from the different value chain in the gas industry in the region, or at least for our countries. We also set an outline for a plan for uh, decarbonization projects, starting with what we call a marginal abatement cost curve. What are the projects that we can do right away? Actually, we start with projects that does not need, need investments. Actually, these projects can save money, like energy uh, saving projects, like uh, uh, methane fugitive emissions reduction projects, gas flaring and others. And along the way, we go to the more expensive and more capital intensive projects like the CCS and CCS. We already have an outline of a plan that we're we already discussed this with the uh, member countries, and some of these projects were already implemented or started to be implemented in Egypt. And also, in this regard, we're developing, and this is, we're doing this with the support of the World Bank and one of the consultants, a harmonized uh, policy and regulations for the decarbonization. And also, as I said, one of the main milestones that we're working on also is carbon intensification, car carbon intensity certification. This is one of the main gaps that we have in the region. If we really want to accelerate decarbonization and reduce the carbon footprint, we need to measure the emissions, not just carbon. I'm talking, when we're talking about carbon certification, we're talking about all greenhouse gases. We need to have proper measurement mechanism. We need to have a uh, certain criteria that is approved and aligned with the, within the region and within the countries. And also we need to have a, an accredited certifier that can not just um, to, to be used in the domestic, but for export and how is this relevant and compared to other sources, uh, not just from the region, but also from, uh, from otherwise. Uh, I think, although we are, we're, newly established, but at least I believe we did several things, whether in, in terms of establishment and the an institutional setup of the forum, like setting up the ministerial, the executive board, the secretariat, the platform for the companies, the JAIAC, the platform for the regulator, the RAC, and also very recently we established uh, another platform for the research and institute uh, and academia uh, working within the region and focusing mainly on decarbonization, in addition to the things that I've been talking about, about accelerating supply and also decarbonization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanos, can I turn to you? And, and if I may just um, add one uh, line of thought to what you're about to say. We haven't really talked about Turkey much yet, um, so maybe you can give us a bit of a sense of uh, how uh, the relationship has developed after um, uh, Erdogan's re-election. Um, if you can offer us a few thoughts, that would be helpful as well in the context of this, of this theme. Over to you. Well, happy to do that. But then um, one specific and two more general comments. Uh, Iran, Iran and maritime security have had their own problems with a couple of uh, uh, ship jackings, uh, you know, a couple of Greek ships that were taken hostage after implementing uh, US-led sanctions. Um, one can argue that uh, the Iranian leadership likes their brinkmanship a bit too much, uh, but at the same time, I think they have been careful not to cross certain red lines. Uh, but accidents and miscalculations are known to happen, uh, so it's important to keep open uh, channels of communication. Uh, renewable energy, this is going to be one of the two uh, great games of the 21st century the other being artificial intelligence, uh, who controls the raw materials and it becomes the technology leader, will have a huge impact on the global distribution of power. Then um, climate change, uh, Fred McTaggart, the um, founder of Greenpeace, once wrote, you know, when faced with an um, extinction size event, the dinosaurs uh, created working groups uh, to prepare reports to be discussed in subcommittees, which will then take the issue to committees, and, and we know what happened to the dinosaurs. So I think we should all, should all be very much concerned about the slow pace of, of efforts. Now, Turkey, um, the last eight months have been uh, much better than the previous four years. Um, it's a different mood. Uh, we can have a long discussion as to why this has happened. Um, but we are trying to explore uh, all possible avenues for maintaining low tension 
and, if possible, resolving problems. I'm less optimistic on the latter, but I think um, this is a good time for Greece and Turkey to make some um, lasting progress on maintaining uh, distant relations without you know, too much offensive rhetoric and actions on the ground. So, overall, I'm uh, optimistic about, uh, at least in the short term. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, so I'll take a quick fire round. Um, please, one point only per, per speaker. Um, uh, Kanika Rakra from India. Uh, the question was actually for uh, Mr. al but if anyone wants to uh, maybe give comments on it. Uh, in the context of net zero, I was wondering uh, when we are looking at policy recommendations, uh, whether we're also looking at consumption behavior and lifestyle changes as an idea that needs to be engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick Charles. Uh, thank you. Uh, just quickly to return to the, the uh, Strait of Hormuz Red Sea issues. Um, uh, despite the efforts uh, in, in terms of international maritime constructs, apart from the United States uh, and one or two others, there's been uh, a real struggle to get proper buy-in to deliver really effective um, responses in terms of protection, um, not least from the region. I just wondered if the speakers had any thoughts on what the real hindrances are, what's missing, and, and what more could be done to get more buy-in into actual protection measures. Thanks. Thank you very much. Iman Raga from Egypt. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, for, uh, addressed for both Amos and the General Secretary of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. Um, do you think that it is important to uh, underscore the possibility of uh, uh, violent non-state actors' attacks and the threats to whatever physical connectivity and infrastructure existing in the region? I understand that uh, Amos has already explained the need and the importance of investing more in expanding those uh, uh, networks and uh, connections physically in the region, but uh, having the opportunity side being very well understood does not underestimate the threat and the challenge that those connections could encounter in the coming future or in the coming few months. So what has been done so far by the United States in helping the countries to foresee and prepare for those risks, either individually or through the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum? Thank you. I'm going to disappoint a few of my colleagues who are in the queue um, because I think we need to, we need to come to a conclusion. So, um, I'll, we'll, take, we'll take those three interventions and have a, have a quick uh, a round of, of final answers. We'll go in reverse order. So, Thanos, I'll, I'll start with you, then Amos, and then, and then Osama. Well, um, just a brief comment on the, uh, on the last question, because I think uh, we are slowly beginning to realize how vulnerable we are uh, in terms of infrastructure. There's so many cables and pipelines uh, that are basically unprotected. Now, in some cases, the answer of the companies uh, directly involved is redundancy, have as many as possible. That's not always the answer, though. So I think all of us need to think, and it's, it's becoming a priority at the level of the EU and NATO, all of us need to think on measures we need to take at the national or regional level, how we can work with each other uh, to increase resilience on, on infrastructure. Thanos, thank you very much. Almost concluding thought. I think that you asked about consumer behavior. I think that we all, every, it's all the above, right? We have to have the energy transition. Consumer behaviors have to change. I can tell you that I believe that that's the hardest nut to crack is changing consumer behavior. It usually changes based on convenience, ease, and cost. And so we have to make a clean energy transition to be exactly that, more affordable and easier uh, and uh, user-friendly to get there. Uh, I think on the shipping lanes, look, you, you've said it, we have, the United States has been committed to uh, securing shipping lanes uh, for a long time. The threat to infrastructure, I take your point that it doesn't matter that I can say we should have more of them. We also have to make sure there are no threats to them. And there have been threats. Even in the current crisis, uh, there have been threats to the offshore, uh, not from Lebanon, as I said before, but there have been threats from Gaza to the uh, gas infrastructure. It shut down one of the, uh, for a very short period of time, the, one of the platforms, which had a direct impact on immediate on the Jordanian and the Egyptian economies. 
So we do have to think about what do we do to mitigate uh, the resilience and to, to do that. I do think, though, I'm going to go back to adding more of it rather than protecting it. Uh, you know, there's, been an, there's an offshore field that has been uh, discovered uh, offshore Gaza uh, that the Palestinians should be able to develop as well. And I think part of the lessons here is we have to put more attention to accelerate when this war is over to uh, bring a platform there. I, I think that more platforms for more people to sort of the mutual assured destruction <laughs> uh, is good on the, on the deterrence. Uh, and it has, of course, the added benefit for the Palestinian people to have a resource that they can both monetize and secure their own energy supply. I want to just to follow up on what Donald said before. We talk a lot right now about the architecture of the 20th century and energy security. But I think you made a very, very important point that we haven't discussed today that is, uh, I think, the most critical of what the future of energy security of supply is. And that's... Uh, Right now, China has a almost 15-year lead on the rest of the world on securing the assets uh, of critical minerals and uh, both the mining and the processing. And this, that is becoming an OPEC of the future uh, of but one country controlling the supply chain. Uh, forget about the geopolitics. It's just not good to have one supplier of everything. You have to have redundancy. And this is not about securing American uh, security supply. We're probably the best prepared for it with the IRA, but it's about the entire world has to have a diversified supply chains of the mined goods and the processing facilities so that uh, there is a healthy competition on cost, price, and availability. Amos, thank you very much. Samad, Secretary General, final thought. Thank you. So I think the, the first point is about climate and energy efficiency. I think energy efficiency is important. As they always say, energy efficiency is the first fuel. So if, if we can really manage to the, the, the operations and the processes of producing energy and also of consuming energy, if we can change this and make it more efficient, th this is definitely much, much better and less costly. For the... Uh, Threats to infrastructure, I think it, it's there, whether it's uh, connecting infrastructure or even domestic infrastructure. That's why it is important how can we, each country and also collaboratively, how can we protect these uh, infrastructures and how can we make it more secure for the security of energy and security of supplies. And I think this is part of the discussions that needs to take place and also I think each of the countries is taking a lot of measures to do that, especially after the, the gas discoveries, significant gas discoveries in the East Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much.